There's really no doubt about it. Stanley Kubrick was a full-fledged camera nerd. Starting as a photographer for Look Magazine, his obsessive drive to use and possess what he considered the world's best cameras and lenses persisted throughout his career. I'm focusing this segment on the ARRI 35BL2, a camera used by Kubrick extensively on The Shining. The look of his films was as important to the storytelling as the actors and dialogue. Always a fan of Araflex movie cameras, Kubrick came to rely on the German manufacturer more and more throughout his career. Starting in 1974 with Barry Lyndon, Kubrick used an Araflex 35BL as the main camera on this film. The revolutionary 35BL was introduced in 1972, having its first extensive use during the Munich Olympics. It was the first handheld, self-blimped, or silent, 35mm film camera that Araflex ever produced. Compared to the Mitchell BNC, a huge and heavy Hollywood standard, the camera was a lightweight at around 25 pounds. It was easy enough for a single operator to pick up and use on his shoulder if he wanted. Impressed with the durability and convenience of the new ARRI 35BL, Kubrick would use it again for his next film, The Shining. By this time, ARRI had introduced a new model, the 35BL2. Debuted around 1977, this is essentially the same camera setup that Kubrick used throughout The Shining. He purchased two of these cameras from ARRI, one for general setup and one outfitted for exclusive use on the Steadicam. The ARRI 35BL2 featured several improvements over the BL1. First, it had a higher torque motor, making use of longer running 1,000 foot film loads. The camera had improved electronics mounted on boards so they could be easily swapped out in the field if there was a problem. There was also a digital LED film counter and speed display, eliminating the noisier mechanical dial. A mirrored shutter alternately exposed the film and reflected an image to the viewfinder at a typical speed of 24 frames per second. The BL2 could also be outfitted with a video assist device, something Kubrick would use extensively from The Shining onward. The video assist used a semi-mirrored glass that split off some of the viewfinder image to a small television camera, essentially allowing the director and crew to see exactly what was being filmed. The viewfinder image was something previously only seen by the actual camera operator. This camera has a similar video assist setup as used by Kubrick during The Shining. By today's standards, it's kind of primitive, using a single tube standard definition black and white video camera powered by an external 12 volt supply. The signal generated could be recorded on a simple black and white video recorder, so the director and cast and crew could watch playback of the previously shot scene. Although the picture quality was relatively bad, one could judge the performance and camera movement throughout a scene. Another improvement of the BL2 was its overall quieter operation, something most people don't think about today in the age of digital. Film cameras can make a lot of noise, and designing a quiet camera that moves a thousand feet of film through in about 10 minutes at 24 frames per second is no easy task. Now, let's get a little technical. What you're seeing here is not really a camera, but a shell surrounding the actual camera movement. The entire mechanism inside, with its noisy gears, belts, and pulleys, is supported on special sound-absorbing rubber bumpers attached to the outside shell of the camera. Even the film holder or magazine has the same structure essentially preventing sound from transmitting outside the camera. This works fairly well for most of the components, except the lens. To obtain the sharpest image, all ARRI cameras had a mechanically attached lens mount and film gate, meaning they were fitted together metal on metal, 
with a thousandth of an inch tolerance for extremely sharp focus under any conditions. The problem with this was that any sound made by the film moving through the film gate was transmitted out through the lens. To solve this noise problem, engineers introduced the lens blimp. No, it didn't fly, but this device enclosed the entire lens, only touching it through rubber pads attached to the outside of the blimp. There were remote levers for the lens iris and focusing points. A little window allowed the operator to actually see the markings on the lens itself. There were also strips marked with both focus distances and iris stops, so you could easily set these without looking at the actual lens. The lens blimp also required a thick piece of optical glass on the front to further prevent sound from escaping. Believe it or not, the whole system worked rather effectively at reducing noise. Sometimes, though, you still had to resort to other methods. Like this production still from The Shining, where the camera is covered in what appears to be a heavy winter coat, no doubt to further suppress sound from the camera. This 35BL2 is in great shape, and I've loaded it with some test film. It's not too noisy, and at a distance, it's undetectable. The beep sounds if the camera is not running at exactly the set speed, for example, when it's first started. The pictures produced by this camera can be stunning, as Kubrick clearly demonstrated. The camera movement had double pull-down claws and registration pins for extremely steady pictures. The 35BL was the first 35mm camera Araflex produced with these rigid film transport features. With the right lens lighting and film stock, pictures created with this camera even hold up to today's rigorous standards. Kubrick shot hundreds of thousands of feet of film through these cameras on The Shining. By the time he was ready to shoot his next film, Full Metal Jacket, Ari had updated the camera to the 35BL3 model, quieter still and eliminating the lens blimp. His final movie, Eyes Wide Shut, was shot mostly with Ari 535B cameras, the successor to the revolutionary 35BL introduced more than 20 years before. As the world moves on, possibly replacing film completely with digital images, it's interesting to speculate what Kubrick would have used to produce his films after Eyes Wide Shut. He was always on the cutting edge of technology. Would he have used the new generation of digital cinema cameras? Would he have stuck with film as some directors like Spielberg, Tarantino, and Christopher Nolan have? Who knows, like all his films, there was always something new and surprising to see.